Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us in our first conversation about youth vaping. Tonight, we will have about a 40 to 50 minute presentation followed by an open discussion with our panel. A few pieces of data to illustrate the importance of the discussion is that according to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services in the state of New Hampshire, 9% of high school students smoked cigarettes in the last 30 days, compared to 25% of high school students who have used a vaping device in the last 30 days. And that's older data. The prevalence of the devices has grown along with the complexity. In my opinion, the only thing that's gotten smaller is the size of the device, which you'll hear about shortly. Let me introduce our panelists so that you may be thinking about your questions during the presentation. Sitting up here afterwards during, for the panel, we'll have Amity Small, the, an assistant principal with the London Area High School. We're going to have Officer Emily Dyer. She is from the London Area Police, uh, London Area Police Officer and our SRO at the middle school. Maureen O'Day, the high school guidance director. Dr. Beth Sheridan, the school psychologist. And Dr. Brian O'Sullivan, he specializes in pediatric pulmonology. He is the medical director of the clinical research unit at Dartmouth Hitchcock Medical Center. And he's also a professor of pediatrics at the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth College. So I'm sure he'll have a lot to add to our discussion. And of course, I'll be up here as well. I'm David Sutherland, I'm the assistant principal, one of the assistant principals from the Londonderry Middle School. Lastly, we have our presenter for the evening, Lori Warnock of the Northern New England Poison Center. So please help welcome Lori to the stage. Good evening. This is my second presentation of the day on this topic. I've been doing about two a week uh, because it has become such a topic of conversation for both educators, parents, and students. I do work for the Northern New England Poison Center. My job is as education coordinator, which means I'm known in New Hampshire as the face of poison because I'm the only employee here in New Hampshire. I travel from Salem to Colebrook doing exactly this kind of presentation. Poison Center, you may know, is in uh, Portland, Maine at Maine Medical Center. It covers Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont. 24-7, free, confidential, 1-800-222-1222. Uh, There's a song, I Will Spare You, a song. It's an easy number to remember, uh, but make sure you put it into your phones accurately. Uh, I understand if it's one digit off, it can be a phone sex line, which is a mistake you only make while doing a live presentation at a senior center, I'll tell you. <laughs> so, 222-1222. You want to get the number in your phones accurately. And I hope, please, take out your phones, double check that they're on silent, and put the number in. It's a great resource to have. We know that kids only get sick or eat terrible things after 5 o'clock on a Friday, when pediatricians' offices are often closed. We're open. You can also text, chat, go on our Facebook page, tweet. We've got, we're, we're all where it is. We are right in the middle of things. We've come to the 21st century technology. So I'm going to talk about uh, electronic cigarettes. And you may know it as juuling. You may know it as vaping. You may not know what in God's name I'm talking about. Hopefully by the end of the evening, you'll have a better idea. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to ask during the presentation. I don't want you to forget what it is you wanted to ask about. Um, so let's begin. OK, so let's do this. There we go. So. We know that smoking is cool. We know this because, as adults, we knew about cigarette smoking because all of the celebrities that we knew and loved smoked. Uh, John Wayne, whether it was Steve McQueen or James Dean, these were the cool celebrities, our role models, that taught us what was sexy. Lauren Bacall, who fell in love with Humphrey Bogart, who died of lung cancer, Lauren used to talk about what a dramatic moment it was as, a, as an actress to flip open her cigarette case, take out a cigarette, tap it, hold it to her lips and wait for him to light it, and then take a long draw in and blow it out in his face. And it was a whole moment of, it was, it was yards of film. It was a whole scene setter for her. I mean, women would clutch their pearls as though they were actually having sex on stage because it was just that kind of emotional moment. And it was a tool for her as an actress.
we also know from all the ads that we saw as young adults in magazines, on billboards, right, was the macho, it was the Marlboro man coming off a long ride reaching for a cigarette, or the guy in the camel ads who had to carry his tire with him and have a smoke, very sexy. Three of the models who posed as Marlboro men died of lung cancer. Yes. And of course, there were products for women because it was the age of equality. So whether you were Wonder Woman, Virginia Slims, or Eve, because you should have a pretty cigarette, right? There were products. A lot of teens look at these ads in surprise because they don't see these kinds of ads. First of all, because they don't look at magazines, but second of all, because we changed the rules about how these products were marketed. If you look at even older ads, I love these. Mama, before you scold me, maybe you'd better have a Marlboro. <laughs> it's hard to imagine this kind of marketing. I don't even know what you need never feel over smoked with Marlboro means. I don't even know what that means. But again, this is the kind of promotional materials that we used to see on a regular basis. Because smoking was not thought to be unsafe, <laughs> not by us as the general public, even though the manufacturers, of course, knew otherwise. Eventually, we caught on, and we learned what the tobacco companies already knew, that smoking tobacco products was deadly, and it was addictive. And they were manipulating their product to make sure that it stayed addictive by modifying the flavors of the tobacco products to make them more appealing, whether it was menthol or smoother or whatever they had to do to, to maintain that um, that appeal and increasing the nicotine quantity and amounts in the products because we know, or they knew, that nicotine was an addictive chemical. We caught on eventually, and in fact, there was a huge lawsuit uh, that demonstrated that, that tobacco companies, in fact, knew that their product was deadly, that they were marketing it toward young adults, and they had to pay the price. Some of you have probably seen the white background ads on television now that have very simple statements and it says at the bottom that this is a result of the settlement against R.J. Reynolds and the other large manufacturers of cigarettes. They have to now pay for these public service announcements about the dangers of smoking. We've actually caught up in the public health world and you've probably seen these ads. Public health began to work against that marketing with our own marketing messages about the effects of smoking, tobacco smoking. Terry, who is the same person on both pictures on the top, she died shortly after uh, that last promotional piece was filmed. Um, and you've seen those ads where someone who's had their, uh, lung cancer or throat cancer uh, and has a stoma, for example, or talks about the cardiac uh, surgery they've had to have as a result of their smoking habits. So we caught on and we did counter marketing against these products. And the good news was it worked. We saw a dramatic decrease in the amount of cigarette smoking. The green line is adults, starting in 1965 to 2014. You can see the drop in cigarette smoking among adults. The blue line is teens. We didn't start measuring this till later on. This starts at about 1989. There was a spike in 95. I'm not sure if that was data related or some kind of event related, but in any case, even among young adults, we've seen that decrease in smoking, which is great for us, not so great for the tobacco manufacturers, right? Because they've lost a significant market. But what they know, and what they knew then, and what they know now, is if they can get you addicted to nicotine as a young adult, they'll have you for the rest of your life. Because cigarette smoking, nicotine addiction, has a very uh, simple mechanism for relapse. It's very easy, if you're an ex-smoker, you know that you could have given up smoking 20 years ago, but there are still gonna be some settings in which you crave a cigarette. And in fact, while we've seen a decrease in all, almost all tobacco products, all of those blue lines, cigarettes, cigars, smokeless tobacco, the one product we've seen an increase in is the red line, which is electronic cigarettes introduced somewhere around 2010, originally marketed as a smoking cessation device, which is a great idea, um, 
And then spiking, especially among adolescents, 2013, and you can see 2014. Now, that last dip from 2015 to 2016 was before the introduction of joules. And so what we've seen in the data already from 2016 to 2017 is a dramatic change in that angle again. And we have a whole new round of celebrities to market these products. Right? These are teen faves, Johnny Depp, Leo DiCaprio, Jack Black, and of course, Jenny McCarthy. So we still have our sexy women smoking as well. All advertising, all modeling this behavior of electronic cigarettes. Is it an effective smoking cessation device? Because that's how it was originally marketed. This is a safer alternative. Well, for adults who are traditional smokers that are smoking uh, uh, traditional cigarettes, yes, these cigarettes are a safer alternative in that they don't have the results of combustion, which would be the burning of the tobacco that creates the tar that has been so caustic in people's lungs and contributed to cancer, uh, and some many of the other chemicals. However, what we actually have is in the neighborhood of two million teens who were never smokers who have taken up using electronic cigarettes. So this is not a smoking cessation device in their, their purposes. It's addiction 101. And we will have a whole new generation of young adults who will develop nicotine addiction that had no cause to begin this as a, some kind of cessation device. I'll also say as a cessation device, Originally, while they talked about this as a cessation device, it would have had to be marketed as a, a medical tool. Well, medical tools, as you know, have to meet very high standards for manufacturing because they're medical products. The e-cigarette manufacturers did not really want a part of that. And what we've actually found is instead of being something that helps people reduce their nicotine usage, in many cases, e-cigarettes actually allow them to increase their nicotine absorption because they don't have to wait for their 15 minute smoke break where they have to go stand outside in the snow in New Hampshire to have a cigarette. They could wear it around their neck and before we had we incorporated this into indoor smoking laws, they could take a puff right at their desk, they could sneak into a stairwell, they could slip into the bathroom, and they could use it more often than they would have used traditional cigarettes. So, uh, in fact, England, which has a higher incidence of smoking among the general public than we do, was about to actually recommend a particular e-cigarette product as a recommended tool that their National Health Service was going to support as a, as a treatment strategy. And the manufacturer, who was about to get this great endorsement from their National Health Service, backed out of the deal because they didn't need the endorsement and they didn't want to have to meet the requirements of being a medical product and medical practice. That's how good their market is didn't need to be part of it. So when we're talking about this as a, as a tool for quitting, while it may work and may be more effective for some people who are traditional smokers, for teens and adolescents, it has not worked that way at all. In fact, it's worked in the reverse, and it's brought about uh, the potential for some serious health consequences. And we'll talk about the actual consequences a little bit. <clears throat> Same kind of marketing strategies, right? Here's our e-cigarette ad. Sexy woman, fashionably dressed, with her e-cigarette, and the old Slim's ad with the fashionable woman and her, and her traditional cigarette. There's our sexy cowboy with his cigarette, and there's Stephen Dorff, action hero, spokesman for blue e-cigarettes, and I might add, emphysema sufferer. And yet, the other element that is very troubling about the e-cigarette uh, epidemic is its specific targeting of teens. Because while we do see some print ads and we see some uh, sporting event ads and that sort of thing, where their marketing has been most effective is in social marketing, social media. The places where we as adults don't usually hang out. And where they have very few restrictions as to how they can target young adults. So if you want an education, 
take a stroll through YouTube and put up things like cloud chasing, vaping, uh, vape mods. You go on Pinterest, any of you, no one's on Pinterest, right? Is anyone on Pinterest? Someone's on Pinterest besides me, thank you. Put up things like vape, vape mods, vape pens. You'll see a world of creativity you never imagined. There are great videos showing how to do cloud tricks, smoke tricks, smoke rings. This particular uh, video in the corner here is uh, three young guys in Canada, all of whom I'm sure are over 18, and they're doing hot boxing where you sit inside a closed vehicle. Three of them each have their own device. They're trying to fill it with as much vapor as they possibly can. They show off their devices as though it was a makeup video. I'm using this product here, this flavor, and they swap it back and forth so they can each try their devices, which is great during flu season, you can only imagine. Adults often don't like to vape inside their cars because it leaves a sticky film on the inside of the windshield or on the dash or on the car seat in the back. If it's leaving a sticky film on the surfaces of your vehicle, it's probably leaving some kind of sticky film on those delicate lung tissues. But So this is a great place where the marketers can reach an audience that's interested, willing, um, impulsive, and unlike other tobacco products, has access because most tobacco products are only sold in registered stores that have to meet specific requirements, legal requirements to demonstrate that the person buying the product is of the appropriate age. But if you go online where you can buy e-cigarette products, what you have to do to demonstrate the appropriate age is click the box that says, I am over 18. And you've now entered the marketplace so that any kid with a Amazon gift card or a Visa gift card from graduation can go and purchase, and they can buy several products and then sell them to their friends, which we see quite a bit of. So social media has opened a whole new marketplace. And unfortunately, the target marketing and the target audience is adolescents and teens. So what do we know about nicotine? Well, we know that addiction in general has a variety of uh, avenues, right? For some people, addiction can be a genetic element, that it's a hereditary um, process, a physiological process. Uh, for some people, it's an environmental uh, issue where they're raised in a house where everyone smokes, so they grow up thinking that's typical normal healthy behavior or at least normal social behavior and they take up smoking. Some people will have their first sip of alcohol and not like it and never drink again. Some people will have their first sip of alcohol and it will bond with them for life and they will struggle with alcohol addiction for the rest of their life. And other people will have their first sip of alcohol and perhaps drink socially. Nicotine, unlike alcohol, is addictive to anyone who is exposed to it. That's the nature of that chemical. That's how it works on the brain. And we know that adolescent brains are still in their formative stage. So what we've discovered is that when we introduce addictive substances or behaviors to the adolescent brain when it's still forming, it can have long-term consequences. In fact, it can prime that brain for addictive behaviors later on in life because it affects the centers of the brain that control impulse, that control satisfaction and serotonin release, so those feel-good chemicals in the brain. So whatever we're introducing during that developmental stage, and we know that lasts till say 20, 21, 25, 45 with some people, but still 20, 21, 25, when we're introducing this to the adolescent brain, it's priming it for, for problems later on. We also know that nicotine does lead to compulsive use because it has a rewarding effect. For some people, it's that first cigarette in the morning that got them going for the day, that first burst of nicotine. For other people, it's the end of the day, the relaxing moment. It can be a, rather a stimulant or a relaxant. We know that sometimes it's a social behavior that's very difficult to get to fight. And we also know that it builds not just dependence, but tolerance. So you need more in order to get the same satisfaction from it. So this is that one ingredient that we do know about that is so available in e-cigarettes. 
Now I know that what I'm going to hear is, but some of the e-cigarette juices have no nicotine. And that's very true. And if you were using this as a cessation device, what you would do is start at a high concentration and work your way down to lower concentrations of nicotine until you had weaned yourself off of nicotine solution. That's a great strategy. But the products that are most popular, not only do they not come in zero nicotine versions, but they actually have a higher concentration of nicotine than the, the refill types that you can normally get. And we'll talk about those specifically so you have a better idea. So this is a display of e-juice, the picture that I took in one of the vape shops. You've all seen vape shops, right? They're everywhere, right? Every small town has at least one. If you walk inside, I have to go to vape shops as a field trip. I have a very interesting job. <laughs> You walk inside and there's sofas, usually big screen TV, sometimes a bar set up where you can sit at the bar and try different solutions, try different flavors, different types of products. You bring your own mouthpiece, you can try on different types of devices to see what you like. Of course, it's only over 18. And the flavors are cotton candy, red velvet cake, strawberry cheesecake, chocolate pudding, uh, Unicorn tears. I mean, they're they're uh, they're all over the place. Do these sound like the kinds of flavors the Marlboro Man climbing off his Harley at the end of a long day is looking for? Man, I could go for a strawberry margarita smoke right now. <laughs> you know, clearly we are marketing this toward teens, and by making these flavors both taste and sound like fun candy flavors, it makes it seem innocuous. It makes it seem safe and it appeals to teens. I actually, when I saw this display, I, I asked the guy behind the counter, where do you get your product from? And he said, well, you know, you can order this stuff from China, but I don't trust it. Yeah. I make my own. Okay. Really? <laughs> wow. This is my own line of flavors. Really? I'm very impressed. What's your background? Oh, well, I used to be the AV manager at Best Buy, but now I've got my own shop. And I'm thinking to myself, that is exactly the pharmaceutical and chemistry background I am hoping for, for something I'm going to suck into my lungs. Excellent. Not that there's anything wrong with working at Best Buy, but I'm not letting them make my lunch, let alone something I'm going to inhale. Okay. The problem with many of these solutions is there's no standardization. It's not like... Diet Coke, where you can test a sample of Diet Coke against tissue and find out what effect it's going to have on lab rats, because there's no standardization and there are 7,000 different flavors and products, you can test sample A, but it's not even going to match necessarily sample B of the same product, let alone someone else's product. And these are some of the great flavors that you can find in the packaging. So does this look like serious smoking materials to you? No. These products are not considered tobacco products by the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms Administration. And they're not considered food products by the Food Drug Administration. So there's no agency that's overseeing the safety and the content of this substance that you're sucking into your body. That means that with the exception of some recent rules that mean they have to have child resistant caps on them, there's no safety guidelines. Um, and you can see that given the flavor and the smell of these products, I have, uh, I may have a bottle with me, they smell sicky sweet, and they're little squeeze bottles about this big. So what we've seen is small children getting into them. We know that the e-juice, as it's called, can, uh, the nicotine can absorb right through the skin barrier and into the bloodstream. So if you're sloppy when you're loading your vape pen, for example, and you drip some of it into your mucous membrane, you, it can give you a sort of uh, nauseating feeling called nicksick. Kids who are trying this for the first time, that first cigarette that you ever had as a kid, that nicotine feeling. But for small children, it can be toxic. And we've actually had documented deaths of several small children from nicotine ingestion. They've gotten into this product and they've died from not, uh, nicotine toxicity. I have a black lab. 
<coughs> he would be after this in a heartbeat. Um, again, for, for small children and pets, this stuff is very dangerous. One of the ingredients that we know is toxic is, um, as an example, so I, I always say, have you ever heard drunk Hershey's chocolate syrup? <coughs> I have drunk Hershey's chocolate syrup. I can tell you that I have tested this theory. I have drunk Hershey's chocolate syrup, and it's safe because it's food-grade sweeteners, food-grade materials. If I turn that into a vapor and I inhaled it, on the other hand, that's a very different process. And many of the ingredients that go into these nicotine solutions are food-grade safe sweeteners like propylene glycol, like flavor and strawberry, whatever. That means they're safe to be digested. It doesn't say anything about whether or not they're safe to be inhaled. And the students out there, you've had enough biology to know that lung tissue is very different than digestive tissue. It's much more fragile, it's much more delicate. You think about squirting chocolate syrup into a washing machine, turning the washing machine on, eventually that'll flush out. But if you squirted chocolate syrup into the vent of an air conditioner, it would have a very different reaction and it would gum up the works. We're talking about a similar type of process. And in fact, diacetyl is a chemical that has a buttery flavor. It was sprayed on popcorn kernels in microwave popcorn manufacturers. The workers would spray it on, it would get into the air, the workers would inhale it into their lungs, and they would develop a condition called bronchiolitis obliterans. Literally, gunky lungs. Sorry, I know it's technical terms, I don't want to get crazy there. This is a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease like emphysema, like chronic bronchitis. And this is an ingredient that is still used in some flavorings. If you are vaping French toast or butter pecan or some of those flavorings, it's very likely that this is still used as an ingredient to give that buttery flavor. But now we're intentionally inhaling it into our lungs. So what do these devices look like? Well, they come in all shapes and sizes. Initially, we saw a lot similar to this that looked like traditional cigarettes. Um, nothing too fancy there. This one here, the green one, if you saw that in your kid's book bag, would you think anything of it? If you saw that on their desk, would you think that's an electronic nicotine delivery device? Yeah, looks like a pen to me. I had one to pass around, but a teacher in one of the presentations tried to open it. She broke it. So I can't do that anymore. can't be trusted. This is why we can't have nice things. <laughs> you can see some of these other devices are called vape pens. They're a little more complicated. These are the kinds of devices that you would select your e-juice rather than coming pre-filled. You would select your juice, you would unscrew it, you would fill it with e-juice, screw it back together, and then um, you would use that device. They can also be used for other liquids like uh, marijuana juices that have THC concentrate in them, for example. The rectangular one is called a vape mod. So again, if you're on Pinterest, look up vape mod. There's a whole world of those out there. And that has a different capacity as far as quantity of liquid, temperature, and battery life, which would seem great. Um, again, no regulation on that product. So those are the ones that tend to explode in your pants. If those words don't terrify you, I'm sorry, but fire in this region of the body is just something I, I think we should avoid. But that's again, when you've got a product with no regulation, this is what we're talking about. You've got your faux cigars, and then of course for your man bun wearing hipsters, you've got a pipe. So you've got the full range of products. And, and in between these, there is such a world of creativity that it would be hard, if you're not familiar with it, to recognize. The basic technology, mouthpiece, reservoir for the liquid, heating element, and then battery for recharging. It's for the non-disposable. This is a very rudimentary version. Here's some of the things you can find on Pinterest. So you've got your entire superhero line if you wanted your Marvel vape pens, your Iron Man, your beach bling, so if you wanted to modify. This is the one that makes school nurse heads explode. It's actually a vape that's designed to look like an, an inhaler, an albuterol inhaler. Um, these are all available online. 
These are vape pens, again, different styles, but all about the same thing. Vape mods. And this is the line, the Athena line, of course, designed for ladies, because we still have that whole marketing thing going, right? Targeted marketing. Some of the side effects of, again, this device that has a battery, it's a heating element, it has a chemical in it, and it is not regulated under any kind of consumer standards, uh, product safety standards. So teddy bears have 17 standards they have to meet for product safety, right? Vape devices do not. These devices can be used with marijuana products, whether that's actual leaf material or um, juices with THC in them or extracts, resins that have extremely high concentrations of THC, the chemical that causes the psychoactive reaction in, in marijuana, whereas uh, smoking leaf material has maybe 6 to 10 percent THC. Resins and concentrates can have 60 to 80 percent THC. So the difference between a glass of water and a fifth of Jack Daniels. I mean, we're talking that kind of strength comparison. And again, these photos are all taken off the internet. This is nothing, no secret squirrel stuff. So I'm always cautious when I do these presentations when students are in the room because I don't want it to seem like a how-to, but frankly, you students could probably find far more intense material than I can provide. So, and for parents, I want you to see what these devices can look like. This is a popular, a newcomer. This is called Soren, the drop over here. And uh, the sort of, these are about palm size. So they're very discreet, <coughs> right? Very innocuous looking. Nothing about that says I'm smoking a nicotine product, but they are. But this is the game changer. So you may have heard kids talk about Julie. And in fact, in the most recent health surveys that have been done for 10 years, the youth behavioral risk surveys or the monitoring the future uh, youth surveys about behavior and activities, they've actually had to change the questions because if they ask, do you use e-cigarettes, many kids will reply, no, I jewel or I vape. So when they've asked the questions now, they use a variety of terms to make sure they're capturing all of the behavior. Juuling has become synonymous with vaping, with using e-cigarettes, because this product has become so popular. It was designed, according to its engineers, as the iPhone of e-cigarettes. It's small, you can see, in fact, a uh, police officer will be showing us some samples she brought of exactly what they look like. It looks almost like a thumb drive. This is a cartridge type device. So you buy those pods, the pods snap right in. The pod is also the mouthpiece. They come in uh, Virginia tobacco, melon, cool cucumber, and creme brulee. Again, you can see the Marlboro man climbing off his Harley and dying for a creme brulee smoke, right? They have a little uh, charger port that you can pop right in the back of your computer. As a parent, would you recognize that that was a smoking device? No. These are meant as a replacement for traditional cigarettes. There is no thought that this would be a cessation device. There's no thought that you're giving up smoking. And because they're meant by the manufacturer as a replacement device, whereas so many of the products are 12 percent, uh, 12 grams per milligram, milligrams per milliliter, excuse me, of uh, nicotine in solution, or 36 when they're really strong ones, these are almost 55 milligrams per milliliter solution. So, because it wants to be satisfying for a smoker, a traditional smoker, as an adult product, but as a product that teens are using as their introduction to vaping, they're starting off with something with a very high concentration of nicotine. And one pod has about the equivalent of a pack of cigarettes worth of smoking, depending on, now remember, when you smoke a cigarette, as, an, as a <coughs> smoker, you may be someone who takes the occasional puff and most of it runs down. You may be a chain smoker, so you're drawing and drawing and drawing. Maybe you don't inhale. There's a variety of ways that you're going to ingest that amount of nicotine. With these, 
they're not burning up in an ashtray while you do something else. They only activate when you draw in. So you get every drop of that solution. And as I said, they don't make a zero nicotine version. Kids will tell you, oh, I jewel, but I only use the stuff that's just flavored water. There's no nicotine in it. They don't make a zero nicotine version. They have no reason to. Their objective is to provide smokers with a satisfying price. Now you can buy counterfeit pods that have different flavors and may have different solutions, different types of nicotine. And there are videos that'll tell you how to break into the pod to refill it with stuff. They leak a lot after you do that, but you know, you can do it because you can find anything on the internet, right? But this has been the game changer because they're so discreet. Kids slip them in their sleeve, they slip them in their sock, they slip them in, it's in their hoodies, and it's very difficult to detect that they're carrying them. In fact, there's a line of clothing called vaporware that actually has hoodie strings that um, you slip the end of the, you slip a little uh, adapter over the end of your jewel device and you can suck on your hoodie string to draw from it. So there's no evidence of you having a device except for the fact that occasionally there's vapor coming from your mouth, which might be a clue. So Juul has been the game changer. Again, these are available online. You can see them in the mall. Kids will buy them in quantity, and they'll share them among their friends, sell them among their friends. And they're very easy. They're very discreet, very easy to hide. Kids will take a draw off of it in the middle of class when their teacher is facing the whiteboard instead of looking at them. And it's just that easy. There's no turn it on, wait for it to heat up. It's suck in, it draws, stop sucking in, it stops. It has some flashing lights they put on just to be kind of fun. Again, who are we marketing to? This is Juno, which is similar, about the same size. Again, it's a pod device. Um, this has 36 milligrams per milliliter, still on the high side, um, and a reasonable price point. You know, if you're a kid with a day job, you've got enough money to... There's no zero nicotine version of this either. Again, they have no interest and there's no market for that. Why would they want to do that? <coughs> so here's what we know, uh, what we don't know about nicotine. When we heat these elements, when we heat the elements in a traditional cigarette, the chemicals change. And we know that things like formaldehyde is created when the components of a traditional cigarette are heated up and burned. The same is true about the chemical components of e-juice. Different chemicals are created depending on the temperature that it's heated up to, depending on the chemical composition and the chemical combinations. And again, because they're so varied, we have no way to sort of narrow down what goes on. But we do know that chemicals like formaldehyde are formed when vaporizers are used. It's difficult to test because we've talked about the different ver versions of this. And we can only test on tissue and on mice. We can't test on humans, obviously. Now, we have a whole pool of human lab rats that we will find out what the consequences are going to be. And one of the consequences that we're just starting to talk about are once we talk to our kids who are already using these devices and, ex and we somehow manage to get them to realize that this is not something they should be doing, how are we gonna deal with their nicotine addiction? Because the patches and gums and things that we have used for adult nicotine replacement therapy are not recommended for anyone under 18. Your pediatrician is not going to be able to give you any advice on what to do about this. So we have that whole challenge yet ahead of us. Are there specific concerns for adolescents? Yes, and this would be the takeaway points for tonight's presentation. We know that it's a social activity. It's a fad like finger spinners, fine, but it has an addictive component. So when the fad fades, the addiction is going to remain. And we're gonna have to deal with that as a public health consequence. We know that these behaviors, introducing these addictive behaviors and chemicals at this stage of brain development will have long-term consequences. And we know that while these ingredients may be food safe, we don't know what the consequence is gonna be as far as lung health. I 
really have to find a more pleasant topic to talk to you about. <laughs> I, I spend way too much of my time talking. I thought when I joined the Poison Center that I would be talking about giving the baby too much Tylenol, something like that, you know. And it turns out I talk about vape, 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 heroin, heroin, heroin. If you have a job opportunity where you just sit in a room and play with kittens, let me know because I really, there are days when I could use that. There are some great resources out there, however. Still Blowing Smoke uh, is a great sort of peer-developed website that has some good materials for peer-to-peer -peer conversations because I can talk to you as adults and that may have meaning for you. Me talking to adolescents and to teens is somebody's mommy talking to teens and adolescents. Um, I always think of Charlie Brown's teacher. Wah, 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 wah. Uh, Dover Youth to Youth is one of the prevention groups here in the state of New Hampshire that's doing some really wonderful, effective teen advocacy and peer-to-peer -peer education. In fact, they're doing some training sessions over the summer uh, for other students that might be interested, and they'll be available in the fall with teams to go out and do peer-to-peer -peer education. They've also created some great materials to be putting online, so if you want to talk to your kids about it, if you want to talk to your students about it, um, or just put these, these videos, etc., up on sites where teens can go and get information. They'll be avail that will be available to you. This is one of those sites. Drug Free NH, Partnership for Drug Free New Hampshire is an umbrella agency that really works with all of the grassroots prevention agencies all around the state of New Hampshire. They have wonderful materials, both peer-to-peer -peer materials, but also as parents, how to talk to your kids at every age, whether we're talking about elementary school students, middle school, high school, college, about the different hazards that they face and how to bring those conversations up. So great parent materials, great educator materials, and connections to the agencies that are in your communities doing good prevention work. And of course, the Northern New England Poison Center, 1-800-222-1222, don't make me sing it. Um, we've got a great fact sheet, electronic cigarettes, and you, we can talk about many of the things that I've mentioned here. Uh, as educators, we've got an e-cigarette, uh, a full, actually, curriculum for middle and high school students, including an e-cigarette Jeopardy game, which in those last couple hours of the school year when you're trying to fill those empty spaces in your calendar, God knows, um, it can be sort of a fun thing to do, an icebreaker. Um, we've all got other materials on our website, so chat, text, Facebook, Instagram. Well, we don't do Instagram. We haven't gotten there yet. But, uh, Facebook, tweet, we're, we're all of those places. So if we can be a resource, and of course, me, I am your your face-to-face -face resource, and I do this a lot. I travel quite a bit. The Poison Center, have any of you ever called the Poison Center? As, I mean, for other things? Oh, thank you, somebody in the back raised. Oh, bless your heart. Do you have sons? <laughs> yes, okay, because I don't know, no, no diss, but I have to say, five-year-old boys are like our frequent flyers, bless their hearts. Um, we take all kinds of calls. Uh, I can tell you that I uh, myself had to call the Poison Center twice in the space of three weeks. My husband uh, takes medication every morning and every evening, and he also gives the dog a pill every morning and every evening, <laughs> and he keeps them on the kitchen windowsill. And so one evening he said, I think I just took the dog's phenobarbital. <laughs> Don't make me do this. So I had to call the Poison Center, disguise my voice, yes, this is Lori, <laughs> explain that this is my husband, he took the dog's pill, what's his weight, okay, is his nose cold and wet, <laughs> very funny, very funny, um, is he sitting in the corner licking himself, no, he could do that, he'd never leave the house, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it was fine, it was not a hazard for him, but two weeks later, when he gave the dog his lipicide, which is a diabetes medicine, it was a problem. You can call the Poison Center for pet information. We'll, we're a good starting point. If we can't help you, we'll pass you on to the ASPCA, which will ask for your credit card number first. We will not do that. Um, in the dog's case, I spent the next six hours giving her a handful of Frosted Flakes every hour to keep her blood sugar up, which who knew that would be a prescription, but okay, thank God we had Frosted Flakes. I've moved those medications to opposite ends of the house now, so. Hopefully, I won't have to call yet again and disguise my voice. But that's the kind of call that we are happy to answer. And approximately 70% of our calls can be taken care of in place. 
rather than having to go to the emergency room. So there's a great cost savings, there's a great time savings, there's also a great sort of comfort level in that you can find out quite quickly, it's okay, that's not an emergency, the fact that your child just ate a handful of desitin is really not a crisis, it's okay, you know, here's what you need to do. So, any questions? I know I've done that whole speed speaking thing. No questions? Well, I want to thank you for inviting me to come up. So if I can have my panel come on up, we'll take a brief break as they get situated up here, and then we will open it up for questions from the audience, and we'll have a little bit of a discussion about what you're thinking. Uh, you can ask about the schools, you can ask about um, some of the side effects. I know I've got some questions for uh, Dr. Sheridan and Dr. O'Sullivan related to the addictive nature of these products. Um, do we have any questions from the audience that you would like to ask? Otherwise, I can certainly lead us off with some questions. None? So i got to tell you, Lori, you were amazing. Yeah. That, Thank you. Yes. And we're happy to answer questions, but yeah. you just covered everything wonderfully. So um, the only thing I would add right off the top is that as to what you said regarding not no standardization, absolutely. When people have done studies of the different e-cigarettes, they find all kinds of different compounds. It's not that one, even in the same brand, as you said, but things that you talked about, the formaldehyde, which, you know, that's where you pickle, you know, when you see on TV, brains in jars and whatnot, and body organs in jars that are being preserved, it's formaldehyde they're using. You don't want that in your lungs. I mean, there's no question about that. They've also found things like copper and zinc and tin and lead in some of these. I mean, you know, Flint, Michigan with all that lead poisoning, do you want to be inhaling that? I don't think so. So, yes, Don kudos. Because a safer alternative is really... Yeah, so, no and, and I would agree with you that perhaps if you're a three-pack-a-day tobacco smoker, using this as a way to cut down may be somewhat beneficial, but if you're a teen who's never smoked, no. That leads me to my first question, which was that reference in Laurie's presentation about the diacetyl, yeah. that's the correct pronunciation, yeah. leading to the obliterins and the COPD. Yeah. What does that mean? <laughs> so can you explain yeah. what, what is happening to your lungs right. as that's taking place? And what's the long-term ramifications? Well, so first of all, we don't know the long-term ramifications because e-cigarettes haven't been out long enough for us to know all the ramifications. Just as cigarettes were extremely popular in the 30s and 40s, and there were ads with doctors smoking cigarettes saying, oh, this makes my throat feel better when I'm smoking my camel. Well, now we've learned after following people for decades just how bad cigarettes are. We don't have decades of e-cigarette use to look at yet, so we don't know all of the ramifications. But I can tell you, from diacetyl exposure, which we do know something about because of those poor factory workers who were inhaling it, not knowing they were doing it, um, it causes scarring in this lung, this thing called bronchiolitis obliterans. The bronchi are the little breathing tubes in your lung. So they, the breathing tubes branch like a tree. So if you think of the little twigs, you start with the trunk of the tree being your windpipe, your trachea, and then divide into your right lung, your left lung, and then divides hundreds and hundreds of times. There's, something like 50,000 little breathing tubes in your lungs. They're tiny. And when that stuff gets down there, those bronchioles, those little tiny airways, get inflamed, get irritated, and then scar. When they scar down, you can't get air in anymore. They're blocked. And obliterans, bronchiolitis obliterans, means being obliterated, wiped out, totally blocked. And when that happens, you don't get air in. And guess what happens if you don't get air in? You can't breathe, you can't do anything, and you know, eventually, unfortunately, you've seen some of the uh, pictures that Lori showed of these people who, smoking tobacco, ended up with tracheotomies, on uh, breathing machines, and unfortunately passing away. So uh, it's not a good thing. Bronchiolitis or butterans is not a good thing to have. Even just the irritation and inflammation that we're seeing in throats and in respiratory systems, just from these ingredients, just inflammation, um, which we know constant irritation of tissue can cause it to um, to um, it's gonna scar 
to scar, but also to uh, get malignant. I mean, it can cause malignancy. So uh, often what we see is someone who's had like constant irritation of their esophagus, for example, can, can develop things like esophageal cancer because the tissue of, um, I can't even think of the word I'm trying to think of, but it uh, turns. It gets infected, it gets weakened, and its defenses are irritated enough that it becomes uh, at risk. So any, even just this kind of inflammation that we're seeing is, is likely to cause problems down the road. So if we have high schoolers or middle schoolers who are engaging in this practice and are damaging their lungs and they play sports, that certainly does not go together. And when that occurs to those parts of the lungs, those branches of the trees, can those branches ever be fixed or are they permanently closed off and damaged? So the key is stopping early. The longer you do it, the more damage you're going to get. And Lori's right, there's inflammation. Inflammation can be reversed. If you stop smoking, the inflammation can go away. But if you reach a point where it's turned into cancer or where it's turned into scar tissue, no, then it's not changeable. Um, one of the real issues is that most kids or adults, but certainly adolescents, high school kids, who start vaping don't feel that damage right away. And that's the dangerous part, because there's not negative feedback. You don't feel, well, except for that perhaps first hit of nicotine where you feel nauseous, you don't feel so bad right away. In fact, you might feel a little high and giddy, and so you want to keep doing it rather than stop doing it. But it's the ongoing, constant doing that leads to damage that then becomes irreversible. I'm sorry, Dan. We see, um, do we know, uh, when someone uses a vapor product for the first time, does it cause coughing like it would with a cigarette? Um, I'm not sure. I don't think so. Interesting, though, I, I don't want to get too technical, but there was a neat little study. The nice thing about doing a talk like this, you make me go back to the medical literature and look things up, okay? So it made me smarter. I'll take that. Um, one of the studies I saw was only in 10 people, so it, it's a very, very small study. They took 10 people who had never smoked cigarettes, never done vaping. They did all kinds of studies on them that you wouldn't necessarily want done, including what's called bronchoscopy, where they sedated them, put a tube down into their breathing tube, down into their lungs, and got samples of lung tissue and lung fluid, so the cells that are in the lung and whatnot. Normal, never done anything. A week later, they came back, and they did three vaping episodes of each just a few minutes each. It wasn't a lot of vaping, but they did three short episodes of vaping and then did the test over again. The changes in the cells in the lung, inflammatory cells in the lung, irritation. So you said there hadn't been human studies. This actually is a human study, not a mouse study. The cells that are inflamed, the, they're actually bits and pieces of lung tissue that ended up in the bloodstream because of damage to the the breathing sacs, the little air sacs where you get the good air in and the bad air out. There actually was leakage there of some of the lung tissue cells into the bloodstream. And that was just, you know, a couple of a couple of drags, essentially more than a couple of drags, but, but just a couple of uses of uh, e-cigarette on one day. So that wasn't even long-term stuff. So the answer is yes, you can get immediate damage. The problem is you don't feel it right away. So there's not that, you know, if you, if you drank Ipecac, the stuff that makes you throw up, you'd throw up, you'd never drink Ipecac again. But this, tr you don't get that a negative feedback right away, unfortunately. Plus, it's a vapor. So you think of, um, there's probably students in the room that can tell us whether or not they cough the first time they try to vape, and, and we won't put them on the spot. But if you think about eating uh, fried dough and you suck in some confectioner sugar accidentally, right? Those are little particles. Now, fortunately, that dissolves, but those little particles will irritate things enough to cause coughing. This is vapor, and as such, there are the particles are much, much smaller, so it's not likely to cause coughing. Now, the nicotine can cause uh, that sudden stimulation, because it's a stimulant, can cause what's called nicksick. You get that sort of queasy feeling, or you suddenly get sort of a rush because it is a stimulant. Um, but you don't necessarily get the coughing, and of course, you also don't get the smell of this product on your clothing necessarily, which is often a cue to parents that their kids have taken up smoking, right? You smell cigarette smoke. Vapor does not necessarily leave that residual odor, and if it did, it smells fruity, which if your kids are anything like my kids, half the perfumes they buy at Bed Bath & Beyond or Victoria's Secret smell like fruit salad to me. So 
it's that, an Axe body spray. I mean, it, those kinds of odors are the kinds of things we're used to smelling and would not raise a red flag for us. So again, it's very discreet and very difficult to detect that they're actually doing this. Yes? I have a question about the vapor part of it. You were saying before, obviously, when they exhale, there is some type of vapor. Mm -hmm. Is it not as noticeable as exhaling the smoke of a cigarette? Is that why kids can do it in class and not be noticed? It dissipates pretty quickly. I had somebody tell me that some kids are not exhaling. They'll just wait for the vapor to evaporate. So that that is also a concern. Now you're holding it in your, your body even longer. What kind of damage is that gonna cause? And keep in mind too, we've had some evidence that, so parents that are vaping inside their car, we've been able to test car seats do uh, surface testing on car seats and find nicotine residue on car seats. So the vapor that they're exhaling is going to have nicotine, so there's secondary exposure concerns as well. So we also, um, they can do, they can double inhale, so you're taking more air around them, so by the time they exhale, it's been, the, the, the amount of water vapor to the air ratio is lower, and then if they're at their locker and the locker door is open, and they're doing blowing that into their locker, we're not gonna see that on video or no one's gonna notice that when you're walking by either. We have the same questions pertaining to smells, right? But you compare these smells to girl, the middle school girl perfume and there's no difference uh, or negligible difference that we can tell to, to move to action Just in, in a meaningful way. Is there such a thing as an odorless vapor too? That's literally a there may be, but because it's the fruit flavors that are such a draw, and the candy flavors that are such a draw for teens, it's unlikely they would do that. If they choose to do something like that, or they can choose to even tobacco sort of flavored products, as I mentioned, Jewel comes in Virginia tobacco um, flavoring. For someone who's a traditional smoker, that would be more appealing. Um, they, they can buy the liquid nicotine solution, unflavored solutions as well, and they probably don't have much odor themselves. Not much appeal, but not much odor. Um, even the marijuana products that I mentioned, because they're um, it, it extracted, the THC has been extracted and it's not burning leaf material, it's not that skunky smell that is so telltale about marijuana. It's more subtle. So vaping can be a lot more, again, discreet. Yes? Um, I just switched gears a little bit, but um, as a parent of both middle schooler and high schooler, um, I just want to hear from the school personnel what, what is happening in terms of what you guys are doing to address this at the schools. I'm hearing lots of stories about it happening in the hallway, in the classrooms, in the bathrooms. So I'm sure. you know, just wondering if all of that is so for the middle school, we actually had Lori out uh, several months ago, I don't remember when, and she spoke to our staff when we first saw this trend appear. Um, and we had had some conduct offenses resulting in the discovery of the big products. That was an education to our staff. We then took that and we educated in our health classes, the students, about it. So therefore, we are kind of hitting it from the staff perspective and then from the student perspective and then now the parent perspective, the community perspective. When students are um, suspected of this, we look at it through what is reasonable suspicion. And we then, of course, launch an investigation to determine what is been reported and what we can determine is happening. As a result of that, we have, at the middle school through the course of this year, had 10 offenses of vaping or having vape paraphernalia on them, which we have suspended those students through a policy. If the high school is similar. Um, we build off that. Um, it's really kind of weird because the epidemic started when the school year pretty much started. Prior to this, like having a tobacco infraction was like unheard of. Um, and then we didn't really know much as much uh, when this started, like, you know, is it really just fruit? Like I had a parent tell me, well, I took all the oils I found and made muffins and things like that. Like we didn't know as much. So that education piece has been important for us too. Yeah, like to go through that sort of thing. And we've worked with the middle school 
And it's happening in discrete times for most, like in between periods in bathroom stalls. Um, so even if you have presence in the bathroom, somebody in the stall and it's odorless, it's tough. So it's a, been a lot of word of mouth. We've closed some bathrooms where we've heard it's been going on. Um, but we, we probably suspend three or four kids a week for it. And I think that's where it's gotten tighter as the suspensions. Now you start with a three day out of school suspension. If you get caught again, it's five. If you're an athlete, and that's the other thing, it's not one type of kid that's doing it. It's girls, boys, athletes whatever, um, who are doing it. So it spans all sorts of things. And um, we're looking at our life of a Lancer policy, how that's gonna you know, now tie this in to have those suspensions as well. And then we're increasing um, staff awareness because a lot of staff, when they see this, they think it's a flash drive initially. So to know that you know, if you find this on the floor, it's not something that they were researching. It's, <laughs> it's you know, a big deal. Um, and getting the word out there that way. Um, yeah. At the middle school, we're also talking to our students because we certainly want to build a culture of an environment where they are helping us in the discovery of these devices because we don't see everything that's going on. And the more they become educated about the dangers of it, um, then they are more likely to step up and help us take care of the problem and, and tackle this. The other pieces too, they might have, one of these might have been six kids vaping. So you heard, you find out who three of the kids were, you search them, but these are, they're also putting them in places that we can't always go in a search that they're sharing, um, at least as an administrator. So it's, it's sometimes hard to locate where it is, but whenever we talk to a kid, we call the parents too, because if we couldn't find it and you know, there's no school consequence, we want you to know that it was on the radar, um, that you know, this is around somewhere. My daughters go to Pinkerton. Uh, I have a freshman and a recent senior, and they have a freshman academy building. So Pinkerton's got some 3,500 kids. The freshman academy holds about 800 kids, four floors. They've closed off the restrooms on the top three floors, and the kids can only use the lower floor restrooms, and they have monitors there. And they're doing 10-day suspensions, and they've had so many that they have a waiting list on their out-of-school program because they're treating it as drug paraphernalia, because it can be. And again, it's jeopardizing scholarships, it's jeopardizing sports participation, it's, it's... As part of college admissions, the applications ask if students has, have you ever been suspended. If you've been suspended for vaping, you have to check off, yes, I have been suspended. And then you have to explain what, you're, what you were suspended for. And then the colleges, some may ignore it, some may not. But when you're looking at the competitiveness of colleges, any suspension can mean your, your acceptance is no longer. And at some level, <clears throat> the police can be involved. Uh, Officer Dyer, can you help us understand the where the police view this in terms of legal requirements of underage okay. Possession of e-cigarettes is the same as possession of a regular cigarette. It's a statutory offense if you're under 18 years old. You will be, if you are caught with that device or cigarettes or any of the products, you can be issued a summons to court where you have to go to court and explain to a judge why you had it. And the judge can maybe give you community service. Your parents may have to pay a fine, which I would make my kid pay back, but <laughs> there's, um, I've heard of kids having to write essays and go back before the judge again with that essay. Um, there are consequences legally if you're caught with that. And the schools do work with the SROs where they can and where it's appropriate, but not every child is found with the device. Yes? Dr. Sheridan, what you, I think that's a great one for you to, to start answering in terms of the addictive nature of it and how we help our youth 
through the addictive qualities of this problem? I think the, the, the first place to start is, is education. So, so those, those parents here who have brought your kids and you teenagers who decided to come on your own, like that, I, I feel like if I was a teenager sitting here, I, I don't know exactly what I'd be thinking, you know? Um, because it, it's like you got a lot coming at you, but I but I want you to understand that at, that the adolescent brain is a really cool cool thing, okay? And that and that this like 13 to 25 is when is when your frontal lobe is doing a massive amount of work, and those of us who have parented through adolescence, it is when you guys start shifting from. Um, from us having to kind of direct you to you guys having real conversations with us, all right? And what we need for you to understand is, is that your brains are working in a way that, that um, you can correct this, I don't have the medical terminology, but the way I look at it, right, is that, is that there are all these neural connections that are happening. And those neural pathways, when you're an adolescent, they're, they're kind of raw, or they don't, they don't have like the, the insulation around them. All right? And by the time you're 25, that insulation is more there. But when that insulation between all those synapses isn't there, all right, it's like you're more open to learning. And you guys learn stuff really fast. All right, You can pick up things. That's why new electronic stuff comes out. And you can go, oh, got it. Meanwhile, your parents are going, what button do I push? And how do I figure this out? Right? You guys have it. You understand. You make connections. But that's where it is that you have to use those connections and understand that you can get addicted way faster. That's why we don't see people that are over 25, 30, 35. You don't see people when they're older getting addicted, right? These companies need for you guys to get latched on it. And the reason why is because your brains, if you start ingesting this stuff, it locks in there. And then you get that habit. And this mom over here that's talking about that, that habit, she's lived it. You know, like it's hard if you've ever, those of us that are coffee drinkers or caffeine, that's another one. It's like that, that's that addiction that can happen where you have withdrawal symptoms if you don't, if you don't continue to use it. And then you want to use it so that you can feel better. So it's simple. All of us can do it with a phone. There are all these other things that we're addicted to. So this one, kids, you, 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 teenagers, you, you, can, you can sidestep it, okay? You have that power for yourselves and for your friends. That's the most important thing, is, is that you guys need to be educated yourselves and then educate your friends. Make it cool to not be. Make it cool, make it okay for your friends to say, you know what, I have a problem with this. I, I don't wanna do this anymore, and I'm having a hard time. And then that's when you have to reach out. You have to reach out to staff, reach out to your parents, go to your family practitioner, because it's, it's an addiction, but it's against the law. It's against the rules. And peer so, support is crucial, mm -hmm. but there are some other great resources as well. So when you talk about, for example, the Department of Health and Human Services has a tobacco cessation uh, agency that does tobacco cessation programs, so quit smoking programs, whether it's the, the National Smoke Out Day in November, uh, the American Lung Association has, uh, and the American Cancer Society have great uh, quit smoking programs. There are traditional programs to help you quit smoking, and some of those may be more effective for teens. There are apps, phone apps, to help you get past those stimuli that make you want to light up. This is your time to have a smoke, play a game instead. So when you feel the urge to go and vape, instead playing a game on your phone to kind of get you past that craving point. Um, so there are new ways that that appeal more to adolescent to teens and adolescents than to perhaps the traditional ways that we've talked about with adults. And one of the problems that we've said is that the, the tools like uh, Nicorette gum or nicotine patches or Chantix, which is a, a prescription medication that can help you quit smoking, none of those have yet been approved for under 18. So we can't yet advise using those tools to help, but I, I see a developing market there. 
and because they're nicotine products, do not be surprised if you see the tobacco companies working to market nicotine products for teens to help them quit smoking and quit vaping, well, which would be an ugly consequence. But you, you made the point before in your presentation, Lori, about how the, there's those of you that have tried vaping, most of you are starting at nicotine levels that are, it's like jumping onto a, you know, a, a runaway train. If this isn't, you're, you're not like trying it, like you're playing around like on a tricycle. Like learning to drive in a Ferrari. Yeah, yeah you yeah. know, like this is, you need to understand, you need to really, really understand the way your brain works and what it is that's being marketed to you. And it's not, it, it is, and talk to anybody that, Every, every one of you knows somebody who's been addicted to something and had to try and quit and stop. Talk to them and ask them what it's like to try and stop doing something that they know that they no longer want to do. <coughs> I don't know one smoker that, that wants to continue smoking. And that's, that's, this is a gateway. That's the, all that I did in my reading too. <laughs> you know, like it's, and it's common sense. I mean, you guys are smart. I mean, it's, it's a gateway. It's, well, there's plenty of evidence that says that kids who use e-cigarettes are more likely to transition to traditional cigarettes. So now you've gone from not smoking at all to vaping with a high concentration of nicotine to getting your nicotine addiction to then switching to the garbage cigarettes that you knew were garbage to start off with and didn't smoke in the first place because you knew from all the education you had and all the pig lungs that you've looked at full of black and tar, you knew were bad for you. And now because you're addicted to nicotine, you are more likely to use those in addition to or instead of eventually vaping because they're more available once you turn 18. And I'd, want, I'd really caution parents and the teenagers that there's no such, well, I shouldn't say there's no such thing, but I'd be very cautious for anything that says zero nicotine because there's no regulation. They can say anything they want on their label. I mean, cigarette makers used to say they were healthy for you. You know, they knew damn well they weren't healthy for you, but they put it on the label. These people put zero nicotine on their on their advertising. It doesn't mean there's zero nicotine. And in fact, that's been found that even in some of the juices, I'm not going to say all, but some of the juices that advertise as zero nicotine, you run them through a machine that measures nicotine, and it's there. So they have no motivation to make it they, zero no, nicotine. They have no reason to be honest. In fact, they'd rather yeah. put some in. Call it zero, put some in, get you addicted, and then move you up the ladder. So, yeah. I have a question medical applies. Um, how does ingesting that much nicotine for the first time affect a kid medically, like blood pressure? I mean, can, can you yeah. see fainting episodes? Because you certainly could. I mean, I think maybe Lori mentioned the, the Nick fits. I mean, it, it makes your heartbeat faster, it makes your nervous system kind of go haywire. So. Yeah, you could absolutely feel jittery. Uh, the fact that babies have died because they've ingested this stuff is because it does terrible things to the brain and the heart. So it's it's not good stuff. Um, you know, like a lot of things used in moderation. You know, you know, there's drugs that can kill you if you overdose too. But that's a lot to take in once at first, and it will definitely make you feel it. Yeah. No question. You yes. think about caffeine poisoning? Is something similar? I'm sorry to interrupt, but. So as an adult, when I drink my coffee, this has maybe 100, um, 100 milligrams of caffeine. Okay, um, if I drink this, I drink it over the course of an hour, I sip it slowly, I have a sluggish metabolism because I'm a woman of a certain age, so it doesn't process very quickly. Think of a five hour energy bottle, which has approximately 270 milligrams of caffeine. And how do kids drink those? They throw them back like a shot and their metabolism is much faster. So it's partly a matter of how you're processing this. By the time a, a student, a, a new smoker, has finished one pod of a jewel, because it's such high concentration, they've effectively smoked a pack of cigarettes, and that kind of exposure is enough to stimulate addiction. So it's not like you've got to go through five, six pods before you'll be addicted. Because it's so highly concentrated and because you're getting every drop of it, it's not burning off into ashes in an ashtray, this one little pod is enough to cause addiction in an adolescent. 
You had a question? So you know that it's happening in the schools because What is the best suggestion for the students who are observing or seeing their friends vaping or smelling it in the halls or the stairwells without having to throw themselves out there as being the dark? You know, and then being potentially bullied or whatever. Um, what's the? Is there a process or a system that the schools are coming up with that, you know, very discreetly students are able to say, "Hey, there's something not sitting right with me." How, like, what are what are the schools doing to make it better and open for other students? Do you want to start? To be able to say I can speak to the house system. So, we get our best information from kids, regardless of whatever has happened. Um, and we don't, when we pull a kid in, we don't say, so-and-so, you know, said this or that. Um, we have the house office system, so the hope is that many kids know who their house office is. They could be going to see me, the assistant principal. They could be going to get a dismissal note, or they could be going to see their school counselor for a schedule change. So you go to your house office, and you say you need to talk to any one of the three of us that are in there. Um, we go into an office, and you share whatever, and that's enough for us to have reasonable suspicion. Um, and then we... You know, we, we're very discreet because we don't want any bullying fallout or anything because that creates its own other issue. And then we investigate and say, we can say that a teacher overheard somebody talking. Um, we smelt this in the bathroom. We were checking the cameras for something else and we saw something that looked suspicious. Any of those sorts of things. And we, we are very good at protecting everybody's confidentiality and addressing the issue. So utilizing the house office system and knowing you can tell a teacher, you can tell um, your counselor, any of it, and we can go from there and protect them. And then we tell them we can't follow up with you to tell you what happened. Um, about the investigation um, because we protect on that level too but just use your house office to help us get ahead of it at the middle school level with the teens we certainly rely on the teens <laughs> our, our wording to all of our students is to immediately report it to a trusted adult and in these situations with the vaping because of the nature of the product immediacy is extremely helpful and allow making us be successful in finding an individual who may be using the product. When we have reports, even hours later, we often are don't have what we need to be able to be successful in moving forward and really finding out if someone's at risk having used one of them. So at the middle school, when we say to tell a trusted adult, then they're able to go to their team, they feel comfortable talking to, let's say, their social studies teacher, and we get that phone call, and we immediately move to work on that by checking. We've got videos around the school we can use to look at where kids went and then take that report, document it, and go from there once we have that reasonable suspicion. The reasonable suspicion is always a tricky one too because you can't say because someone smelled like strawberries, they might be vaping. It, you know, but that's what we've almost come down to some days, you know, is to, to what it is to try to find out um, what's going on. So really at the middle school, it's the teams and the trusted adults that come to administration um, about what they see and what's reported to them. The other thing that's important is reinforcing that not everyone is doing this. While 25% of kids may be vaping, 75% are not. And so while you may see six kids posting on their spam Instagram accounts pictures of them vaping and getting away with it, there are 75 kids that are not vaping and not posting up videos, but you're not necessarily seeing that. So We've, reinforcing that, no, not everyone is doing it. We and have a thousand kids in our middle school, I'm rounding, and we have 10 incidences all year, eight students. So it's a very, very small percentage, right? Eight tenths of 1% of students. So it is a very small, but we're worried about every single one of them, and those are the ones we caught. Those are the ones we know about. And that's also not the ones that are vaping outside of school, and that's why we want this for. That's about the education piece and the health classes. That's having that trusted adult to talk to at the middle school, and that's what we want to try to help prevent uh, from happening in the future. DHHS has a lot of advertising for like domestic violence and things like that. You can go into those bathrooms, and there's a poster in the bathroom that says, you know, if you or you know somebody who has whatever, is there something similar like that that's coming up for vaping that can be actually kind of like in your face? You know, you're sitting in the bathroom, everybody kind of goes there during the day. <laughs> right. It's on the back of the door. I can tell you that it's in every bathroom about domestic violence. Right. So, should be in every bathroom. But 
Is there anything like that that could potentially be in the school setting that DHHS can do or you know, public health? The Partnership for Drug Free NH is actually starting a big promotion. If you go to the drugfreenh.org website or you follow them on Facebook, they're, they're just starting a whole series on e-cigarettes and on vaping and some of that material is meant to be table cards in the cafeteria, UNH calls their bathroom door stuff toilet paper. That's their news, their news articles that they post right on the back of the bathroom doors. And because it is good messaging, it's a good, quiet place for messaging. But you said, you know, at this age group, repeat, 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 repeat. Right. In your face. Yeah. Reinforce yeah. You know, I remember when they first had, you know, this is your brain on drugs, right? Mm -hmm. And then Friday, you right. came on. And that kind of hit home for a lot of people. But until you start really seeing the effects, you know, I work in a hospital. I was with a 39-year-old man today who's waiting for a lung transplant because of his substance abuse and his past one and a half year vaping history that just fried his lungs. So now he's got to get new lungs and he has to wait for somebody else to die in order to get his lungs. You know, it, it's criteria. As we finish up the year and talk about plans for next year, and certainly this is one of them when we look at what we want our students to learn from and, and to be healthy, I think that's a great idea that Amy and I bring back to our schools and talk about over the summer we and are, make our plans. We really are, this, this wasn't anything on our radar last summer, um, so we didn't have a plan in place of how we were going to unfold and have this. This has been more reactive for us since like October, um, so we are looking for things, you know, getting this to happen before the end of the year, having this um, and working with parents because we don't know the effects, we're still trying to, you know, we want to scare them but we also want to give tools to help. I mean, there's not marketing yet for this nationwide. It's it's happened so quickly. So we it, this is a big issue on our radar, and I know it's been frustrating for parents too um, to, to figure this piece out. There was a, another hand over here earlier. Yes. Um, I see a lot of teenagers in my practice and mental health counselor, and I I ask almost every teenager uh, what they think the percentages of the of the kids that that vape or jewel in the school and. You said 25 vape and 75 don't. I would say it's, if you flip that, it's 75 do, or at least you've tried it, and 25 have not tried it. So when we do surveys, we ask about like past use in the last 30 days. Have you used in the last 30 days versus are you doing this on a daily basis? Are you doing this on a weekly basis? And we know lots of kids have, have tried it. I mean, it's, you know, it's, everywhere and it's available and it seems fun etc but that continued use because it gets expensive plus you have to continue to get the product which is challenging if you're under 18 um, so while many kids have tried it and will say oh yeah I, I vape yeah the actual continued use doesn't seem to be that high but again we have to sometimes go by what they tell us and what they tell us in a survey versus what they tell you in the counselor setting can be very different, so somewhere in between. And that's why the peer-to-peer -peer education programs tend to be most effective, because when they're talking to each other about it, they tend to be more candid, making sure they have the right information, accurate information, and then take it and, and see what works well. Uh, the Seacoast area kids just did a whole uh, film night over in Epping at the cinema, where they had 12 different videos that were all created by the high school students about different topics vaping, why 21 is the age for so many things, bullying, etc. And those can be, I'll send you the link for those, but they're a great resource because the kids get to watch them. I used a, a commercial today uh, when I talked to the 8th graders, the 7th and 8th graders in Rye, I used a commercial about vaping that the uh, Dover to Dover kids had made up. And the, that hit them way more than my yapping at them. So. And we know that there's more incidences than we have been able to substantiate in the schools, but we also know from the social media and the reports from the students that there is a significant amount of it happening outside of schools. I mean, the, the students are only in our buildings for six and a half hours a day, and they're, they're somewhere else, the other 18. So I think that when you mention the, the displays and the national programs that are out there, then I start thinking about, well, what should we be doing over at Lapa? What should we be doing at the skate park? What should we be doing wherever to, as we say, put it in their face um, to help 
also take a look at it from that perspective. So. Also, I mean, you guys got to keep this in mind. This thing is so tiny. They share them. They pass them back and forth. Two kids might stop at somebody's locker. Maybe they both used it at somebody's locker. Nobody else notices because there's two kids in front of a locker. Uh, they were hiding them in toilet paper rolls mm -hmm. in one of our bathrooms. Mm -hmm. The janitor dropped them. Great. So now you don't have, to have any idea whose mouth has been on that. Mm -hmm. Grosses me out, but you know, apparently it doesn't bother the kids. Leslie, you have a question? Leslie is our esteemed eighth grade health teacher. Everyone applaud for Leslie. She's oh. wonderful. wonderful. Legislatively, we talk about adding e-cigarette usage to indoor air quality laws, right? One of the reasons you can't vape in a restaurant any longer, you can't vape in a school building, you can't, can't, uh, you can't carry uh, your uh, vape device in a checked bag on an airplane, you can't vape in an airplane, is because we've included that legislatively under the, the rules about cigarette smoking. But if we change kids, the rules... They're, they're, they're selling it to other kids. Well, if we change the rules to include this, as we do other tobacco products, that it could not be sold online, that would be a huge gesture on the part of our national legislators in restricting access to underage users, because then you'd have to go into a venue like a marketplace, a, a, a CVS, or not CVS anymore, but a, a Quick Mart. You know, I can buy these these devices right next to the Slim Jims and the Five Hour Energies. They're hanging right there. They're behind the counter with cigarettes. Um, but I have to prove that I'm of age to do that. Online, you don't have to. So if we talk to our legislators at the federal level about adding, covering these products the same way we cover other tobacco products, that would be a huge change. We hear it in our community. So we hear it in our community, and I'll let Officer Dyer speak about it from her perspective of the police department. Um, just from the kids, we know that Craigslist and Let It Go are two very popular sites. Our, young, our middle school students can get rides from the high school students to wherever they're, they need to go from the vendors from these sites. As far as selling them, um, you know, if we could catch a kid selling them, we could probably charge them. But it's really hard. Nobody's going to give up their buddy you know, that's providing them with this stuff, but I wish it were different, but it's, you know, it's just like, and I hate to use this example because I don't want to make it sound like kids are using marijuana, but it's the same thing if you had somebody, you're not going to rat out your drug dealer, right? Because uh, you're worried about repercussions, you're worried about getting picked on, you're worried about somebody potentially beating you up. Um, and of course, any of those things, that could be a result of somebody telling on another person. We have other charges that we could address with that, such as witness tampering, which people don't think of, but that is something we've been considering with a lot of different things. So as far as bullying, you know, like you tell a kid to stop, you tell a kid to stop 50 times, there has to be a level where harassment comes in, and there is, and then it becomes witness tampering. There's already a case where you've been told to stop harassing someone and you do it again, it's witness tampering. You say, you know, you better watch your back, witness tampering. So there are ways to address that, but again, it's getting kids to talk about it first, to admit that they're doing it and where they're getting it. So that's a huge problem. 
with them. financial decision. So, you know, you start vaping 
you know, 35 bucks to start, and then, okay, you're gonna have to have a line item in your budget to be spending <laughs> however much every single day in order to maintain that habit. You could have a car, you could have all sorts of other nice things that you know, open in your lungs. Jim? Um, throughout several of the different conversations, plenty of points have come to my mind, most of which I just wanted to make comments of. Um, I'm a pediatrician in town, and first I want to give Ms. Kuka some kudos, because I had an eighth grader in my office today who told me she learned about vaping from Mrs. Kuka in her health class. So I mean, right. Yeah. to you. The scary part for me is I also had a fifth grader in my office today talking about vaping at the elementary school. So Mrs. Small, you have a awesome. challenge. It's going to follow you. So I think there, there's so many pieces to this that are very difficult. Um, you know, from the mom who asked about, you know, do, can you see it? You know, you'll see cars drive by with a big puff of smoke coming out and my high school kids laugh like, oh, look at that person vaping, that person vaping. But my understanding is these kids are basically taking the hit off the vape pen or the jewel pot, whatever, and they're just blowing it into their sweatshirts, and you don't see it. I have a, an athlete at the high school who tells me they're vaping on the back of a bus in uniform, coming home from sports events. I mean, it's frightening, the things that I hear. You know, I have a kid that runs into the door as soon as he gets home to go to the bathroom because he says he will not stop in a bathroom at school now because he doesn't even want to be in there because he doesn't want to be associated with it, because he doesn't want to get caught just in case somebody else is doing it, like guilty by association. It's it's a huge problem, and we've talked about it at PTSO meetings, and it, I feel badly for you administrators because it's I think it's a huge problem. But I think my point of all of that to say is I think what you're doing is a great idea, talking to parents, because the number of parents that have never heard of this, I don't have a clue, and I'll mention it in a doctor's visit, are you vaping or jeweling, and the parents are looking at me like, what is she talking about? And, and you know, and some of the kids are giving me dirty looks. Like, look, why are you telling them this? But I had a mom just recently tell me that she was literally picking up dirty socks and whatever off of her teenage son's floor. And this wasn't in my office. This was a friend, you know, and said that she found this bag of stuff under his bed. She didn't know what it was. And when she, you know, basically um, questioned about it when he got home, he admitted what it was. And he said, well, at least I'm not dumb enough to bring it to school or I'll get suspended. So. Some of them are no better than to bring it to school, but it's happening at home, it's happening you know, in other kids' cars. So I think the point is, is that doing this kind of community education is good because a lot of parents, including me, didn't know until you start hearing about it and seeing it going on. And you know, I think probably <laughs> Dr. O'Sullivan will probably start seeing more and more kids coming in you know, with asthma exacerbations and things going on where they have medical problems, but they don't think this is dangerous, you know, so. And I agree. I think that having this type of an event, and I think if we plan on having one in the fall again, um, we wanted to get this out there now before the summer. Uh, this will play on our YouTube channel as well as our local cable TV station um, hopefully over the summer, so we will get some exposure there. Um, it is 8:10. We certainly are able to stay here, but out of respect for my panel, uh, who I said this would end around 8 o'clock, I wanted to thank them. Maureen, did you have a quick? I just want, um, what we're going to be doing next year is we're going to be doing a Wednesday wellness series and it's going to be the second Wednesday of the month for elementary, middle, and high school parents. It's going to be held in uh, room 221 here at the high school and our goal is to cover different topics regarding mental health. Um, we'll have a series of events posted before the school year starts. All of them will be the second Wednesday of the month here. Second Wednesday of the month, starting when school starts when in the fall. School starts in September. For uh, open to the community, the community talking yeah. about student mental health. Yes. And certainly this, this falls in that category. So panel, thank you very much for coming this evening. And thank you to everyone who joined us tonight as well. Have a good night.